All right, welcome back. We finished chapter four on exponential and logarithmics. Now we are moving into chapter five and six, where we will be talking about trigonometry, which is sine and cosine. In chapter five, we will be talking about trigonometries from the right angle, right right triangle approach. In chapter six, we do the same thing, but using a different approach. In chapter seven and nine, we combine them together and try to see they are actually the same thing. All right. So in order to talk about trigonometry, we need to talk about triangles. And in order to talk about triangles, by the definition, triangle means there are three things called angles. Okay. I think we're family, fairly familiar with what we call sides, which are the segments. But now we want to talk a little bit about how to define the three angles, which are things I draw here. Okay. So that's the first section, angles. What do you mean by angle? Basically, we use angle to tell how big an opening is. Usually, it consists of one vertex and two ray. Okay. Try to recall what we mean by ray. If we say something is a straight line, that means this one extends forever to the left and right. If we say something is a segment, that means this one has a fixed length. It stops here and here. No longer, no shorter. If we say there is a ray, that means we fix one side, but it goes forever on the other side. So what we have here is actually a ray, but we don't have to draw it. Okay. Then we say this opening here is an angle. That's the definition. Okay. We have one vertex to a ray. Note. Uh, our focus is only on this angle here, so it really doesn't matter how long these two sides are. They are just they're, they're there to tell you the direction. So this angle is the same as this angle, as long as the openings are the same, even though they have different lengths of size, because technically we have a ray. Technically, this one goes forever. We just didn't draw. It. Didn't draw. Okay. Second, how do we tell people we are talking about an angle? Usually, what this is what we do, and usually your angle is not alone. It should be in some kind of object. A, B, C, D, and O with vertex. Okay. So usually, when you want to talk about a specific angle, what you tell people is, number, for example, this angle I draw here. What you tell people is, you first write down an angle sign, and second, you tell people. In terms of this order, that is the vertex is in the middle, which is the O here. Okay, you tell them where this one starts, go all the way to O, and then go all the way back to D. That means the angle I just draw. Some examples: this angle, you can call it COB. You can also call it BOC. In geometry. We really don't differentiate between if you go start with a C, go with, goes to B, and if you start from B, it goes to C because they are basically the same angle, same size. Later, when we do analytical geometry, however, these two will be different. One is positive, and the other one is negative. But for now, it's pretty easy to tell. All right. Now we have the definition of angles. We want to talk about how big the angle is. Of course, we want to give it a number. When we give something a number, we need to tell people the units. Okay, and for units, we do have two different type of common units we use. The first one is degree. I think everybody is familiar with, and the second one is radian. I think everybody is also familiar with. Okay, so let's talk about degree first. What do you mean by degree? Basically, what we do is we take a whole circle, which is probably the most complete angle you can see. It goes from here. It go all the way around, and then it stops at the same time. And we call this one 360 degree. Then one degree is nothing but take this whole angle and divide it into 360 equal pieces, and each one is just one degree. My drawing is not accurate here. Okay, what I draw here is probably 10 degree, but you know what I mean. Where does it come from? Originally, it's coming from uh, the days in a year. You know, back then when people try to do the calendars, it's not that accurate. So they probably roughly see there are twelve months in a year, 
and then there are 360 days in a year. So they use the same thing for the time and for angles, which is no surprising because, you know, back in the ancient times, people tell the time, tell the year, days of the year from observing the stars. And then the star, if they rotate with respect to the Earth, let's say this is the Earth, the star, once you see a star, and the next time you're going to see it at the same position, it's going to be after a whole year. Okay. No, no, actually, not the whole year, a whole cycle. right? So that's actually how people uh, calculated those kind of things. Plus, this is a really nice number. So if one-fourth of that, we will have 90 degree, something we call a right triangle, a right angle, corresponding to perpendicular, And something we have for is 180 degree, which means you go to exact exactly the, uh, the opposite. The up, and you go 180, you go down. You go to the east, and then starting from there, 180, you go to the west. Okay? That's what we have for degree. Can you go beyond the 360? Can you do 720 degree? Of course. That means you start from here. You start going. But once you finish one cycle, you don't stop, you do it, and you complete another cycle. This is commonly seen in gymnastics. When you try to spin, when you try to flip, right? Sometimes you can do a complete 360, sometimes you can do more than that. Of course, you don't have to be exactly 720, which is a multiple of 360. You can do 400. That basically means you start from here, you do an a uh, 360 and you have another 40 left over so together it will be roughly something look like this and if you really want to look at it the size of this additional part is roughly 40 degree so if you just draw these two the look of 400 degree is no different from 40 degree because there is a complete 360 be between them okay so what you can do to tell the difference is you can actually tell people you start from here and how big the angle is go just like when you draw this thing, now you can actually draw it for more than once. All right, that's handy. Now we need another um, unit, which is called the radian. Why? Well, if you know the radius of a circle, you should know the per parameter or circumference of the circle. So in ancient Greeks, what people were trying to do is trying to say, hey, for some circle with this radius, how long is the circumference? For some one with a longer radius, how long is the circumference? So can we somehow measure the relation between the radius and the circumference of a circle? and we want a really convenient unit. And this is how they do it. You take a circle, you take the radius. Now what you do is you take a rope, which is exactly the same length of this radius. Okay. Now what you do is you start to wrap this rope around the circle. And as far as you can see, The reading cannot cover the whole circle if you just took the same length as the radians, right? What you can do is you cut part of the circle, which gave you an angle here. Wait, let's go this angle here. Then we call this angle y radian. So what do you have there? The radian is exactly what you have, okay? When you wrap the radius here, so this thing here is going to be R2 on the arc length, and this thing here is going to be R. You have a fixed angle here. This angle corresponding to Y radian. Okay? With that in mind, now you can wrap another one. This is 2 radian. This is 3 radian. You can keep wrapping it, and you will know how long the circumference is by trying to calculate how many radians do you need in order to cover the whole circle. And for now, we know because the whole circle is going to be 2 pi r. Therefore, 
360 degree, which is a whole circle, should equals equals the radian here. That's how many radius do you need in order to cover the whole circle. Then that's how many radians in order to cover the whole circle in terms of angles. Okay. From here, you can see this is very convenient because, because it gives us a formula which is called 2 pi r. Otherwise, you need to write something like 260 degree times r. And moreover, you need to make sure r has the right unit. So it's, it's a bigger number. This looks way nicer. Okay, that's what we have for my reading. Now, how do we convert between these two? Very easy. If you go to from degree to radian, you just take whatever you have, divided by 180, which equals pi, because 360 equals 2 pi. And if you want to do the, the opposite, degree. You simply just divide by pi, and then you times 180. Let's try some example. 90 degree. Okay, it's a degree. Now you want to convert it to radian. You just take 90, divided by 180, times pi, which give you pi over 2. Radian. If you have pi over 3 radian, It's going to be pi over 3 divided by pi and times 180, which is going to give you 60 degree. So that's how we convert it between these two. Okay, so what about one radian? That's going to be 1 times 80 over pi. And you know pi is not a nice number. We need a calculator for this. And it's roughly... Is not working. Let me use a calculator instead. Mm, what I want is 180 divided by 3.14. Roughly 57. So this is how big a radian is. It's roughly a little bit less than 60 degree degree. All right, now we can convert between them. Which one is better? Number one, for now you are probably more familiar with everything in degree. You say that thing in your real life. You never say I'm pi over three, right? You always say I'm 60 degree, 70 degree, and 90 degree. But for now, please get used to reading because we will use it later for anything related to circle and also trigonometry. So everything we say from now, try to say it in reading. It will take you some time to do the transition, but trust me, it's totally worth it. The reason is very easy to see. How big is this? I'm talking about the angle. It's kind of hard to tell, right? But if you do this, and instead of degree, you do radian. I will skip the calculation. These two are the same. Now ask yourself, which one do you prefer to say? How big is this? You know 2 pi. That's one circle. This is nothing but a 3 times as 2 pi. So this is going to be, and then again, and then again. This is actually a circle spanned for 3 times. Sounds good. So that's why we prefer um, radians in general, because just by looking at this number, you roughly have an idea like how big the angle is. But by looking at this, 360 is not an easy number to divide. Right. Even for something like this, 7 pi over 6, how big is it? You know it's a little bit bigger than half the circle. Right. But if you convert it to 20 to 10 degree, it will take you a while to calculate how big that thing is. So again, radians actually give you a natural imagination of how big the angle is. That's why we prefer that. All right. Now the third thing, angles in standard position. Okay. 
what do we have here for standard? That means we take some intuitive rough ideas. We want to make it clean and standard so everybody can see it in a nice way. Same thing with farm. We, when you have animals, you have mass tanks. You want to actually put them in a standard position in your farm so they become horse, they become cattle. So now we have two wild angle. Which one is bigger? It's kind of hard to say. So how do you do it? You actually align them and make sure their initial side align with each other. Then all you have to do is just compare the ending. You will see clearly the red angle is bigger than the black angle. Okay, so for easy comparison, we probably from now on for any angle looking like this, we want to write them into a standard way, which looks nice. And what's better than just putting them all into a coordinate system. So let's see how we do it. From now on, every time you see an angle, you want to put them into the standard position. A, O, B. First, you take O, you put it at the origin. Second, you take the initial side and put it here to make sure it's always the same as the x-axis. Finally, you take the ending side and make sure you actually keep the angle to be the same. This is how you do a standard angle. All right, initial side here, terminal side here, vertex here. With this kind of notation, we can solve several mysteries we had before. Number one, is AOB the same as BOA? Now let's put it. To do AOB, I start from A. This is AOB. What is BOA? BOA is the same thing, but you want to align this one with the x axis. So this OA will be forced to be here. So that is the angle of BOA. The black one is AOB. The right one is BOA. So what do you have? You have they're not the same. Okay. They're not the same in terms of they share the same sides. Which I don't know if you feel comfortable, but we can put absolute value. But they share no orientations. They have different orientation. That's why we say one is positive and one is negative. That leads to a next concept. You will have positive and negative angles, which doesn't make sense for negative angle, right? Now, think about it. Negative angle basically means a positive angle going into the opposite direction. That's all it means. So for positive, we take counterclockwise, and for negative, we take clockwise. So in this way, angle AOB is positive, angle BOA is negative, and they share the same size. Great. A third thing we can do, that is, we don't need AOB or BOA anymore, right? If you want to draw an angle, it's always like that. What do you have? Number one, you don't have to tell what people people what the vertex is anymore, because it's always the origin. Number two, you never need to tell people where the initial side anymore, because it's always in the direction of the x-axis. So what you have for the angle is purely determined by the terminal side. So from now on, whenever you want to draw an angle, you just draw this, and you just draw the terminal side. You really don't have to tell me have to tell me the vertex is here 
and the initial one is here, I automatically know it always start from the x-axis. And we give it a name. Number one, we delete the angle sign. We don't have to say it. Number two, we delete A. We delete O because we don't have people tell people where it is. We just need to tell people where B is. And now to tell people we are talking about angle, we better use Greek letter. So that's settled. This one we can call it angle alpha. Now we don't even have to say the angle sign. So alpha, or maybe beta, or maybe theta. That's roughly the common letters we will be using. Alpha, beta, theta, maybe sometimes gamma. All right. With that in mind, let's try some examples. Try to draw alpha equals 400 degree. Alpha equals negative 100 and let's do 200 degree. So what do you do? You start from here, you go 180. Remember, negative just means going in the other direction. And then you go another 20. Okay. You can try more examples. It's not our concern here. Now you can see a very interesting fact that is called quadrantal angles. Because the nature of the coordinate system automatically divide the whole space into four quadrants, which we know how to do back then when we have um, points, right? The points in the first quadrant, second quadrant, and third quadrant. All right, then automatically this one divide all the possible angles into different quadrants, which is determined by the terminal side in which quadrant. So it's easy for us to say 400 degree is the angle in first quadrant, negative 200 degree is the angle in the second quadrant. One easy exercise for you can to try is try to write down some random angles and ask yourself which quadrant it is. I will write them down. I won't pause too much, so you pause by yourself and try to write down your answer before you look at mine. Which quadrant? Uh, let me see. Angle. Quadrant. Pile of three. You pause by yourself. Okay, think about this one. How many nines are there? In 700. <laughs> mm, that's gonna be. Pay attention to the negative. You can try more by yourself. Okay, there's nothing tricky here, but I would say try 10 of them and try to give yourself something with negative, try to give yourself with something with a big number to finally get, get familiar with what you have here. All right. Finally, one thing you probably have already known, 
That is the idea of coterminal angles, which indicates two angles. They share the same terminal size, but they are different. <laughs> One example is given by 400 degree and 40 degree. They are coterminal. Pi over 3, 7 pi over 3, try to draw both. You will find them coterminal. And I believe you already see okay, the trick. That is, if two angles are coterminal, which means they have the same terminal side, then the difference between them is given by a multiple, which we use an integer n, times a complete circle, which is 2 pi. Of course, for better notation, we call it 2 n pi, but really, it's just an like integer times a 2 pi. All right. That's all we have for angles. Some other side topics, really quick. The first one is arc length, warmer. If you have a circle, if you have an angle, and if you know this r and the theta, I'm wondering how long this arc length is. Now, if you think about it, how long is the whole circle? And this arc length is nothing but a part of the circle. So a circle times a fraction. <laughs> how big is the part? Well, this is my angle, and this is the whole angle for a circle. And this should be the proportion of how big this arc length compared to the whole circumference. Now, if you simplify a little bit, that's just the theta times r. Note, if you want to use this notation, you use the 2 pi. That means everything has to be in radian. If instead you use the 90 degree, 60 degree, you cannot use this formula until you convert 90 degree to pi over 4. Otherwise, this formula doesn't work. Okay, that's the arc length formula. Very useful. For example, think about it. If you have a tire and you measure the radius of the tire through this former, you, if you measure the, uh, the angle here, you will be able to know how long this arc on your um, tire is. Well, maybe that's not a too useful example, but you see what I mean. Okay. The next one is the area of a sector. That is the same logic. If this is theta, this is r. How big is this area here? Again, it's a proportion of the whole circle. The whole circle is pi r squared. This is part of the circle. And again, it's a theta divided by 2 pi. If theta is pi over 4, that's 1 quarter of a circle. If theta is 2 pi, that's a whole circle, right? Then, if you do it, the area is given by that's the form of a sector. And this one is way more useful. And let's see the example. If you go to a pizza place, which gives you a circle, okay, for the same price. Same topping, same everything. Okay. Which one is bigger? Which means which one is more worth the money? A half nine inch pizza or a slice, which is one eighth, right? So that is going to be. 
Actually, how do you do slice of a pizza? You you do six piece or do you do eight piece? Let's do six piece for either numbers. Or slice, 60 degree sector of a 20 inch. Okay, so this is your choice. You have a small pizza, nine inch in terms of diameter. But you have half of them. Or you have a choice of a bigger pizza. <laughs> with 20 inch, but you can only have one slice. Okay. Assuming the same thickness, same topping, same everything. Okay, same price. Which one is more worth it? Now it's your job to figure out. And of course you find, you see, it's a matter of finding the area. This is easy. R is 4.5 square. Your theta is gonna be 180, which is pi. Remember, use a radian. Simplify a little bit. This is 9 over 2. So 81 over 8 dot pi. Now for the 20 inch, but you only got one sixth of it. Pi over 3. Okay. Then r square, which is 10 square. Now, which one is bigger? Without a calculator, you can tell this one is bigger than 10, but less than 11. This one is definitely bigger than 11, because 11 only gives you 66. You still have more to go. Therefore, for what we have here, this one is the choice. Of course, to know the exact number, you probably need a calculator. So that's how we do sectors, a simple formula to know. All right. Finally, we want to talk about rotation speed. You have something rotating, spinning. It can be a gyrocopter, a gyrocopter. It can also be um, I don't know, a, a, a swinging of a, a baseball bat. It can also be a rotation of a tire of your car. So we have a lot of rotations in real, in real life. Now we want to quantify how fast this one is rotating. Now we have two ways of doing it. The first one is called angular speed. Now take your arm and try to rotate it. I think you can actually do a very slow one, like this. Or you can do a very fast one like this. Of course, they rotate at a different speed. <laughs> so think about how should you define this. Angular speed, we call omega, is given by, you divide by t, of course, for unit by how much you can cover within a fixed time. Say within one minute, you were able to rotate it for four times, and within one minute, you were able to rotate it for 40 times, then of course 40 times is bigger than four times, 10 times bigger. So that's the rotation for angular speed. Let's try some examples. Let's take a clock. And you know both hand rotates, right? Can you calculate the angular speed of the hour hand, minute hand, or 
for a second hand. Let's do our hand. How long does it take uh, our hand to, to cover the whole cycle? 12 hours. 4 for 2 pi. So that's pi over 6 reading per hour. Minute hand. How long does it take? The minute hand to cover a whole complete cycle, which is 2 pi. It will be 2 pi reading per hour because you need one hour, or you can use a different unit, which is 2 pi over 60, which is pi over 30 reading per minute. Now your second hand. Now you know the trick. How long does it take you? One minute, right? So it's two pi reading per minute, or it's pi over 30 coming from 60 seconds for a complete cycle per second. Rotation. Second thing, when you drive a car, you have the engine meter reading, give you something called RPM, which is revolution per minute. Okay, so what's the angular speed if you have 6,000 RPM? Usually you don't do that, you do 4,000 at most, 3,000. Otherwise you hurt your engine for regular cars. But for race cars, of course you want to hit that. But now for 6,000 RPM, what's your omega? That's one minute. Okay, You do 6,000 revolution, and for each revolution, it's a complete circle. So that's... Okay. That is your angular speed for the RPM. All right, that's the first way of quantifying rotation. Now, second way, take something which is rotating at a constant speed. But this time, I'm not wondering about your angular speed. I'm actually wondering about every single point on this one. Okay. And I'm wondering how fast are these things moving, which we call linear speed. Now you can see within the same time, everybody here rotated to here. For the same time, can you see this point travel this much, but this point travel this much, but this point travel this much. So from here, you can see the further you are from the center, the longer you travel in the same time. That means the faster you travel if you're just talking about the regular speed, which is distance divided by time. That's what we call a linear time. All right, how do we do that? Now for linear, we care about distance. Now our distance looks like this. What is that? That is not a straight line. That is an arc. Okay, do you know the formula? Yes, it's theta times r. Then what's the linear speed? It's gonna be theta times r. Or if you put these two together, it's going to be omega times r, which is the angular speed times the radius. So we have two formulas. They're connected. The first one is arc length divided by t. The second one is the angular speed times r. I won't go over example because it's so easy. You just do the angular speed, then you times the radius. 
What's difficult? Or what's interesting is, what does this one imply? That means if you have the same thing rotating, the one with a bigger R is going to be have a faster linear speed because everybody on this bar share the same omega, right? So the bigger R is going to be faster. So no doubt, when you try to use a baseball bat to hit the ball, if you're going to swing it, you're not going to hit the ball here. It's going to be too slow. You want to hit the ball at, to be as far as possible. Of course, you cannot hit it at the tip because of the size and the shape of the bar. But usually, you want to do it as far as possible. And if you're strong enough, you want to take a longer bat, which is harder to swing, by the way. But if you're strong enough, this one definitely hits the ball farther simply because you can have a bigger linear speed with the same rotation. Okay. Same thing with swords. If you're thinking about how to, I want to say kill people, but hurt people with the swords when you try to swing it. Okay, think about all the movies you see about the swords. You will be really surprised to see some guy to hit the people with this part of the swords. Usually they want to go here. Okay, and the reason is, again, you want a linear speed. A bigger, a longer sword actually give you a faster linear speed. The only drawback is it's harder to swing. So if you think about something in Japan, they actually have some styles, which you have something called um, patotsutsu. I don't quite remember the word. But basically what they do is they carry, the, they carry super long. Let me see if I can do it. <laughs> This other person. They carry a super long sword. Yeah, that's the best I can do. They carry something super long, which they carry with both hands. And they only got one shot to hit other people because there's no way you can swing back. Okay? So they just practice their skills so they can actually win the battle with one shot. But once they do that, the linear speed is so fast that you cannot even block. If you block, if you got a really good sword, which is long enough, the sword will actually cut you and the swords you used for blocking into half. Okay? But that's some side topics about linear speed. Finally, will bigger tire save you more gas? For the same rotation, bigger tire travels further because of the linear speed. Meanwhile, it's harder to actually make the bigger tire rotate. So what will be the ideal tire for you to make? What's the, what's the size? If it's too big, it's really great in terms of linear speed, but it really consumes too much energy to rotate it. If it's too small, of course, the smaller you have, the smaller the linear speed, even though it's easier to spin it. Okay. So what's the best shape, best size of tire? That's a very interesting mathematical problem you can think of. Okay. Either way, that's all for today.